that you just got to go, whoo! Something that I have been saying the past couple of months, but on any given difficult day, is this. Every mountain top is within reach if we just keep climbing. The Marin IJ published an article this week that Carolyn Gautier shared with me and it's called The Story Behind Juneteenth and How It Became a Federal Holiday. I left them a voicemail asking them if they could listen to this talk, and so I'm gonna call their article Juneteenth 101, and this talk is Juneteenth 101 Amended. <laughs> the definition of freedom is the power or right to act, speak, or think as one can without hindrance or restraint. And there are three different kinds of freedom. There's freedom from constraints, freedom to, a freedom of opportunity, and freedom to be, that freedom of being that connects with personal identity. So stay with me because I'm, I'm gonna connect this to Juneteenth, but if we can have the next slide. I was recently in North and South Carolina, and I feel like every time I come up here, I say, I just came from somewhere. <laughs> and I was walking down the street, and I saw this sign. And it's about a, what used to be a five and dime called McCrory's. Um, stores back in the day had lunch counters, if you're old enough to remember those things. They had lunch counters, so you could go into the store and you could shop but there was this lunch counter, and you could sit at the lunch counter, and you could have something to eat. And back then, you could have something to eat unless you were black. In 1960, and if we can have the next slide, four North Carolina college students attempted a nonviolent attempt to protest the whites-only section that was at a Woolworth store in North Carolina, and they were denied service. In fact, they, this was the very first organized sit-in of its time, and they were there waiting and waiting until the store closed. And there they are. Next slide. After that, college students started to protest. There was a series of sit-ins that occurred around that area um, and they were all young black college students all over the South. And in Rock Hill, where I happen to have seen that sign, there were 10 students who sat at the counter and were refused service, and those students were arrested. And while the arrest took place, 100 people were outside, McCrory, uh, outside McCrory's protesting. Next slide. These men were taken to prison um, directly from the courtroom, and they were sentenced to one month. Um, they were chained to each other. They called that chain gang. They were chained to each other while doing um, mandatory labor. And the NAACP and CORE, another organization, um, and other students continued protesting on their behalf and in honor of them until McCrory's finally closed down. That's the letter from one of the students to their parent about why they felt they had to do this work along the struggle for freedom. The students began to sing spirituals. And it's a part of why I wanted Sharon to sing some of those kinds of songs. They sang them to keep their spirits up. They were told that they couldn't sing. And when they continued to sing, they were placed in solitary confinement. 
And if you see that note, it says, we found ourselves in a 12 by 12 foot dark room furnished with a commode, a small sink, and one lone drinking cup. So when you match the definition of freedom, the power to or right to act, speak, or think as one wants to without hindrance or restraint, freedom from, freedom to, freedom of being, this situation that I just described happened after Juneteenth. So do I have difficulty with the fact that Juneteenth is supposed to rec represent a day of freedom? I do. Because what they went through was not freedom. That, that situation, and many others like that situation, occurred after that announcement in 1865. I submit that we're not free. That, that song that they must have been singing, that cry for freedom, for escape, continues even now and is reflected in a lot of the spiritual and gospel songs, the need to push back, the need to be strong, the need to escape. There's this uh, song called Tell Heaven. Tell heaven, tell heaven, tell heaven, I'm on my way home. And it was a song that was often sung because death was better than what they were going through. So then, what's the Juneteenth freedom? Where, where is that freedom? What, when was that freedom reflected in the historical action that had to do with Juneteenth? Well, some people say that Juneteenth is the anniversary of the announcement that ended slavery in the United States. Some people say that Juneteenth is the anniversary of the end of slavery in Texas. It's neither. From the definition of freedom, from the slides that we just looked at, freedom wasn't present. In reality, no freedom was present then. The late announcement, which happened two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, only pertained to Texas. It was delivered in Texas, in Galveston, for Texans. And there were 250,000 enslaved people then in Texas. And they weren't free by that announcement. A lot of states, a lot of slave owners in states had begun to move their, their slaves and their properties to Texas because they knew that for whatever reason, Texans didn't know what was going on about slavery. And so Texas was like the, the last hurrah for many slave owners. And on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was, was delivered and many soldiers under Lincoln and many slave owners knew about that but said nothing, they were silent. And so it was almost illegal for enslaved people to read at that time. They couldn't read or they faced death or beating. And so people knew that, for the most part, they wouldn't have read that information. It's only if someone would have told them, and a lot of people didn't. Andrew Jackson, in fact, who preceded Lincoln as president, died 11 days prior to that announcement. But on the day of his death, and he had to have known about it, he had 150 slaves. Amen. Through other people's silence, they were complicit to continue slavery for two and a half more years after the announcement had happened. Next slide. So what did it say? Well, it said a number of things. And by the time General Granger came to the state of Texas to deliver this announcement, and a lot of people have in their mind that Lincoln told him go, and so he went, and and delivered the announcement, Lincoln was dead. He had been dead for a number of months before Granger went to Texas. And there were these 250,000 people in Texas who were enslaved, and the idea is also in people's minds that he delivered this message to 250,000 enslaved people, and they all went out and partied. But 
he delivered it to the people who were present in the spot where he was. And he delivered the message in a couple of different spots, but he did not, under any stretch of the imagination, have the ability to have reached 250,000 people on June 19th, which means that on June 19th, there were not 250 enslaved people who said, oh my gosh, I'm free. Stay with me. A lot of people heard later. Um, it may have been that other enslaved people told them about it. It might have been that a slave owner who was kind enough shared the information. It's not like they read it in the newspaper. Um, but it wasn't until five months after that, and every law of that nature has to be ratified. It wasn't at the time of the announcement. It didn't get ratified until December of 1865. And so it wasn't the announcement that freed people, it was the ratification of the 13th Amendment that freed people, that, that said that people should be free. And it didn't occur on Juneteenth. It, it was ratified on December 6th. So what did that proclamation actually say and mean? Well, let's look at it. So it says, one, absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. Connection heretofore existing between them becomes that of a, an employer and a hired laborer. Freedmen are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages. They're also not allowed to collect at military posts and will not be supported in idleness. Um, next slide. No, let's go back to the other one. I'll talk from that. So it says all slaves are free, but many, many slave owners didn't allow their slaves to become free, even if they were standing there listening to the proclamation. History bears out that a lot of slave owners said, if you leave, I will kill you, um, I will beat you, you may not go anywhere. So that didn't occur. Um, they wanted, the, if they had to abide by the law, they wanted them to at least make it through the harvest season and then let them go if they absolutely had to let them go. Um, two, it mentions the equality of personal rights and property. They were turned out, the people who were allowed to go were turned out with nothing. They didn't have any property. They didn't have anything that they could take with them. And so it, in essence, kept them in bondage of a certain, of a different kind of way because they, they couldn't have survived easily because they, they didn't have a job. They didn't have a job before um, and they weren't going to be paid. They were turned out with nothing. They couldn't even travel far without food or water or anything. They had only what was on their back. They were advised to remain for wages, but it, this order is not to the slave owner that they must pay wages. If you notice the, the wording in there, it says, somebody ought to pay you. <laughs> they ought to, but it didn't mandate that. And so it's not as though they could then turn to the person who had been enslaving them and say, now I want you to pay me X number of dollars, and they would have gotten it. That was a wish, a hope, and a prayer. And then it says, you may not loiter. We're not going to give you money. We're not going to give you a place to stay. We're not going to give you a means for transportation, but don't hang out. And the reason why it says that is because loitering was considered something against the law. And so if you loitered, you could then be imprisoned. Another form of enslavement. So these words gave license to arrest and jail people if they didn't have a means to be able to leave. Um, I don't consider that freedom. It, in fact, became what was called Jim Crow law. So legislators eventually took all of these little things and added things to it. You cannot drink from a water fountain. You cannot use the same bathroom as someone who is white. You cannot enter in the same movie theater entrance as someone who is white. 
and started to pick very tiny things that would also imprison you because it became a, a possible jail sentence. And it ended up with the number of people of color who were imprisoned skyrocketing. And a lot of people wonder, how did that all start? That's, that's where it began. So I gave you all the bad stuff. So then what about Juneteenth? What is it? And why should we observe it? It's the anniversary of the announcement to end slavery in the state of Texas. That announcement preceded the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which said that slavery is illegal. So it was a step. And part of the reason why I titled this talk, The Struggle for Freedom, is that every struggle is steps. It's pieces until we get there. We can only get to the mountaintop if we keep climbing. So it was a step. It was a step in the process. That announcement preceded the ratification of the 13th Amendment, and the 13th Amendment became a piece that allowed for lots of civil rights legislation, which later followed. Next slide. However, the 13th Amendment even has a loophole, which allows for slavery under certain conditions. That loophole encouraged the creation of the black codes that I mentioned and Jim Crow laws, and that's what became the beginning of large-scale um, large imprisonment of many people of color because it, it, it was something that people could hold on to. If we can't keep them as slaves, what else can we do? We don't want to let go of that domination, and so how else can we do it? And even in governmental documents is this quote, while the order was critical to expanding freedom to enslaved people, the racist language used in the last sentences foreshadowed that the fight for equal rights would continue. That's in White House documents. So what does Juneteenth allow us to do? It helps us to remember the harsh reality of silence. It was silence that kept people from hearing that announcement for two and a half years. It was silence that kept slave owners from telling their slaves that they should have been free people. It was silence on the part of all of the people who knew that the Emancipation Proclamation had been written in 1863 and said nothing that allowed a horrendous situation affecting human beings to continue. And it allows us to commemorate those who did the work leading to Juneteenth and those who did the work that started from Juneteenth and continues to this day. It's work that is a victory, little victories along the trajectory of freedom in the struggle for freedom. And it helps us to remember the definition of freedom and that anything less is not freedom. If we can remember that no one is free until we are all free, then we recognize that every one of us has a part in continuing that work toward freedom. Amen. And it's freedom, freedom for those of color, freedom for those of differing gender, um, differing places on the gender spectrum, freedom for those of different sexual orientations, freedom for women, freedom for children, freedom all the way around, freedom for people of different abilities and disabilities. We're not free until everyone is. We can't stop and we can't say, oh, let's fix this by saying, let's celebrate Juneteenth and all is well. All is not well. And it falls to us. Even now, as we continue that struggle, the poem that Kevin read was banned in parts of Florida. 
It was read to students and a school banned it and it is now considered um, among the literature that people are considering banning statewide. And it was read at the inauguration. It's like, really? Really? How much do we need to continue dominating over each other and removing each other's rights to think, to be, to walk, to live? And the fear in speaking out, people just want to keep the silence, the silence that, that enslaved people, the silence that preceded Juneteenth is what kept them enslaved and what continues to keep us in various forms enslaved. So this Juneteenth, I invite those of you who can to put yourselves in the shoes of those who have struggled for freedom. You should have gotten a little piece of paper when you came in. And if you feel that you can do this, fine. And if you feel that you can't do this, fine. But what I want you to be able to do is to commemorate, to know what it feels like to hold the energy to commemorate, ah, if you don't have a piece of paper, there they are. By, by standing in the shoes of those people who were a part of that struggle for freedom and continue to be a part of that struggle for freedom. So the best commemoration to me is to commit to that struggle, to feel what it means to hold someone else up who has been on that journey to stand in their shoes, to stand with them and by them. So I'm gonna just say names. And if you are comfortable and you have that name, then please just stand. And your standing is the standing in honor of the work that that person has done. John Gaines. I'm just going to say the names, and then when, if you'll stand, stay standing. Clarence Graham. Thomas Gaither. Willie McLeod. Robert McCullough. Willie Massey. James Wells. David Williamson, Jr., Mac Workman. You represent the students who were present for sit-ins day in and day out and who were imprisoned because you stood steadfast in the struggle for freedom. Stay standing. White abolitionists, you are the people who stood by and who risked your lives as people who were white in the struggle for freedom, some of them even to death. Am I missing anyone? Ah, thank you. William Still, who is the voice of the underground freedom Many people give to Harriet Tubman, but William still actually freed many, many more slaves than Harriet Tubman and risked his life and the life of his family, and you stand for him. Just feel that for just a moment. And can you turn to face each other and applaud for the person who you represented, who stood in the struggle for freedom. <laughs> to me, that's what Juneteenth is about. Amen. That's the celebration of Juneteenth to me. 
As Audre Lorde says, I was going to die sooner or later, whether or not I had even spoken myself. My silences have not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. What are the words you do not yet have? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die from them still in silence? We have been socialized to respect fear more than our need for our own language. I began to ask each time, what's the worst that could happen to me if I tell this truth? Our speaking out will irritate some people, get us called bitchy or hypersensitive and disrupt some dinner parties. And then our speaking out will permit others to speak until laws are changed and lives are saved and the world is altered forever. <laughs> Next time, ask yourself, what's the worst that will happen? And then push yourself a little further than you dare. Once you start to speak, people may yell at you, they may interrupt you, put you down and suggest that it's personal, but the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and easier and easier. And you will find that you have fallen in love with your own vision, which you may have never even realized that you had. And you may lose some friends and lovers and realize you don't miss them. <laughs> and new ones will find you and will cherish you because you spoke up and you will still be able to flirt and paint your nails and dress up and party because you may say, if I can't dance, I don't wanna be a part of your revolution. And at last, you'll know with surpassing certainty that the only thing more frightening than speaking your truth is not speaking. You may sit down. Can I have the next slide after that? These are the people who sat at the counter. And next slide. These are them now. They are an indication that Juneteenth is a part of the trajectory, the struggle for freedom. With it, we are reminded that knowledge and allyship and speaking out are our continued tools. Courage takes us along this trajectory and freedom is our common goal. May we have the the affirmation. Can you say that with me? On Juneteenth, I will recognize that silence has no place in the struggle for freedom. I stand alongside those whose radical acts moved us along the trajectory of freedom. I will be a sounding board until we are all free. Amen.